Good morning and thank you for your welcome. It's good to be with you here again this morning. Before we read the scripture, I should bring you the greetings from the South England Conference. The president is very insistent and he questions us when we get back. Where were you this weekend? Oh, yes. And you remembered to take the greetings from the conference, didn't you? Yes. So I can say in honesty on Monday morning when I'm questioned on that. It's a while since I've been here. But I am here under different guise now. Um, I only started in the conference on November the 1st. In fact, on November the 1st, the president suggested I would go down to London with him to meet with the London Ministers' Council. And they said to me, what have you been doing all your life? And I said, well, 40 years ago, I thought I'd completed my accountant's training. But I now discover, in fact, I've spent the last 43 years training to be the conference treasurer. Um, there's various parts of good news that people, they only seem to hear of the problems at the conference. They hear that we bought 35 acres of land up near King's Lynn and that we made a bit of a hash of it. And we did. We managed to almost bring the church into disrepute. But there's some good news. Our planning permission was going to run out on April 4 of this year. And on March the 31st, we had our planning permission confirmed by the chief planner in Norwich because we'd complied with all the preconditions. How our builders managed to do all that in three weeks, I don't know. Um, they did a magnificent job. So we stand on the cusp now of a new era up there. We have funds put aside to do the first stage of the development and our conference trustees have to give us the go-ahead. So... Not only do the conference officers need praying for, and believe me, they do, but the executive committee needs praying for as well, that a week tomorrow, on the 21st of May, they have several momentous decisions to take. One of them is to go ahead with the development at North Rankton, so that we will have a site there that not only provides camping for the pathfinders and retreat for the youth and other members of the church, but a place that we can bear witness to the community that we're not the type of people they thought we were a couple of years ago when we made a hash of it. We would like to be able to run retreats there. We would like to have a facility that provides a cafe for the village with healthy things, an un-coffee shop. They have no cafe in the village, no shop in the village, no school in the village. So if we provide some facilities, this would be terrific. About six weeks ago, I was coming back from a visit there, and I was imagining how this would work out, and I could see how the, the main clubhouse would work with a hall for meeting in the retreat and a, a proper kitchen and a cafeteria. And then I thought, we get to the Sabbath morning, and then what do we do? Well, the answer is there's little notices on the tables when the villagers come in, as I hope they will, and we say to them, well, today's the Sabbath, and we don't do commerce on the Sabbath day. So you'll have to come and be our guests today. We can't charge you, but you're very welcome to come and join us. What that's going to do with the minds of the villagers, I don't know. I think it's going to play havoc with them, because that's not the way they envisage that we treat them. So I hope we're going to get that opportunity. It will be a place to go to retreat. I say to the fellow direct, my fellow directors down there, would you rather take your retreat to, for example, the Holiday Inn Express in Aylesbury, or North Rankton Hall, in among the trees and the fields there. And it's no contest. Apart from that, as a conference, we've been given a fantastic opportunity. A few weeks ago, we had a workers' meeting at Newbold. That's, that's an unfortunate term, that. One of our directors differentiated in the last executive meeting between workers and non-workers. Those who are not employed by the conference and who are trustees took offence to being referred to as non-workers. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nevertheless, they call it workers' meetings. After the meeting, there were some people from Adventist World Radio there, including the executive vice president, Craig Scott, and they said, could we have a meeting with you? So we went to their offices in Bracknell, and they said, we have been approached because there is a license for a DAB radio station in London. 
that is coming up for sale. And because we have a relationship with Babcock Engineering, who actually do the technical broadcasting, because as you know, AWR have done shortwave broadcasting for decades around the world. They said, they have come to us and said, would you like first option? They said, we believe in this so much that the broadcast fees, which will be nearly £200,000 a year, we have already voted to pay them for you for the next three years. And if it goes well, we'll pay them five years. We'll give you a million pounds worth of broadcasting fees for nothing. But you've got to take on the project. You can imagine, um, controlled panic is probably the closest. Nobody's come to us with an offer like this before. Let me go back a week or two, because it is relevant, I think, to know how these things work. As well as workers' meetings, we have something called field leaders', leaders meetings. Technical church jargon and the business administration. Basically, the president, secretary, and treasurer of the two conferences and the British Union and the presidents of the Irish, Scottish, and Welsh missions get together for a day of brainstorming. And we're not looking at the reports or the business or such. We're looking at what we would like the church to be doing, where we're failing, where we're succeeding. And at the last meeting, one of the things we had to discuss was, 50 years ago, if we wished to get the message out to the general population, we would hold a campaign, a public campaign. And I can remember, even in somewhere like Newcastle 50 years ago, they would get several thousand people on the first night. That does not happen now. That te technique does not work. People do not come out to those meetings. So what do we do to replace it? What can we do? And we had a, a day of thinking about it. And we couldn't come up with a solution. We had a season of prayer. We talked around the problem. Our problem is we do not reach the unchurched people in this country. Some people try and tell you well, it's, it's the white English people we don't reach. Believe me, that's not all. We do not reach the unchurched people full stop. That's it. Why would they come into our churches? No reason to. We need to find a way to reach them. We are told that we need to have ourselves out there, whatever that means, and they will find us. So we have to do something that puts us in the public eye. Adventist World Radio are convinced that a DAB radio project would be just such a means. I don't know whether you're aware, but all modern cars now, for example, have to have DAB radios in them. I don't know whether you're aware that the first country in the world, which is Norway, has switched off their FM radio broadcasting. They now only have DAB radio. I think Switzerland is next in line. The country with the biggest penetration of DAB listening is United Kingdom. So this would seem to be a way. It gets very complicated. I don't know whether you caught on Natasha's report about the training in Romania, and they said Radio 2.0. Radio 2.0 is radio with pictures. That's DAB radio. That's exactly what they're training for. And we had a couple of our technicians there from the SEC specifically for this. We are preparing the reports to take to our trustees on the 21st of May and say to them, we have a project that will cost maybe £300,000 a year. This first year, AWR have offered to pay £200,000 of the broadcast licence. They have offered us use of their radio studio facilities. They have offered us £50,000 worth of technical equipment and all the technical assistance we need. If we transfer some of our people in the media department to work in this project, we're not going to pay any extra than we're already paying. Oh, no, that's not quite true. We have to pay Ofcom the broadcast license. That'll cost us £100 a year. So our contribution is £100 plus some staff. AWR is going to put £300,000 in the first year. Are we interested, they said. We were speechless. It was only two weeks after we'd had a meeting saying we don't know what to do. 
Some people might say, well, this is London, isn't it? And AWR said, we recommend you call it Adventist Radio London. And we said, why? Well, they said, firstly, it'd be based in London because that's where the license is. Secondly, they said, DAB Radio is listed alphabetically. And so you'd come before the BBC in the listing. <laughs> they don't miss many tricks. They are really enthusiastic and keen that we do this. And I, I pray that we can persuade our trustees of the same. This is a vision for a project to, to reach the unchurched people. We don't have a major project to do this at the moment. Technically, underneath the DAB channel, and this, by the way, will not be holy entertainment for Adventists. This is broadcasting to reach unchurched. Underneath, you have a website, and you have multiplexing. You have all sorts of channels. We can use different languages. We can have a channel of church music for Adventists to listen to. Most importantly, we will have a presence on the internet and on DAB radio. And when people go searching, they will find us. Interestingly enough, the unchurched people don't have a built-in bias when they see the word Adventist. It means nothing to them. There's not the prejudice that sometimes the Christian churches have among themselves. And we were told it's very important that we brand it up front, Adventist. Now, going forward, they want us to have a shop front in one of the big shopping centres in London, maybe Westfield. A big glass front saying Adventist Radio London and they can, people can see us broadcasting. We'll get one of our famous Sabbath sofas there, because there's quite a few of those. I have one in my office in Watford, actually, because there's no room up in media to keep them all there. And they'll have the Sabbath sofa out there. And I don't know whether you've seen that, but they invite people to come and sit down and talk to them. And they interview them sitting on the sofa where they're relaxed. Possibilities are endless. The opportunity, well... Technically, the opportunity ran out two weeks ago. We had to have signed by then. We can't sign until our trustees have said so. So did we lose it? No. Adventist World Radio said, we will sign on your behalf, and if you don't go ahead, we will stand the £40,000 loss of the deposit. But they said, we pray that you go ahead. So they're doing everything to assist us. We've got to make sure, I think, that we don't let them down. So we have two big things to go to our trustees. I mean, we, we have other things, but to let you know that we are actually doing something down there. Um, we have problems that we can't necessarily solve ourselves. And I think when you look at the... When we had the builders down who were doing the work for us in North Runcton, they came down to Stanborough Park to meet with SDA Association. As you know, SDA Association Limited owns legal title to all our buildings, all our properties. They came down there and they were slightly amazed because everywhere they went to try and get us our planning permission, people said, we've been waiting for you to call. We thought you would come. The chief planner changed the plans for the roads to be done so that the local villagers couldn't object. Everything fell into place. Now, if you're a construction or a builder or, or whatever, in Norfolk or anywhere else, words like divine and providence don't normally fall into your dictionary. And they didn't know how to describe, they were trying to say, it. it's, almost like, it's almost like magic, they said. It was amazing. It truly was. You need to remember our projects. I think they're very important for our church. The DAB radio, we will have a small glass cube, God willing, up at North Runcton. So when we have retreats there, the media team can come in knowing that their little studio area is already set up, ready to go. Um, it's important we have the chance to plan these things from the start, that we get it right. If we get the go-ahead and use our builders, it will be a quality project. We've, we've had it with Bodge Building. And I'm not going to tell you all the stories I've been dealing with across the conference. I go home very stressed at night, so it's the only thing that really stresses me. And we have to get proper builders in to do it right the second time. We want to try and do it right the first time going forward now. I'll leave you for the time. I'm hoping you're going to hear good news coming out in the near future as we make progress on these things. But 
you will remember some of your prayers, I'm sure. Let's go back to the Bible now. I'm not actually preaching on Isaiah today, but I want the scripture from Isaiah, still my favorite book. Chapter 40 of the prophet Isaiah, one that's quite well known, I think. <clears throat> See, the first three verses are up on the screen there. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her <clears throat> that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, and the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all the people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, because of the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flower fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. May God had his blessing on that portion of his word this morning. In the fifth book of uh, fifth chapter of the book of Lamentations we read because of this our hearts are faint because of these things our eyes grow dim for Mount Zion which lies desolate with jackals prowling over it you O Lord reign forever your throne endures from generation to generation why do you always forget us why do you forsake us for so long restore us to yourself O Lord that we may return and renew our days as of old. When we have worship down at the SEC every morning, at the end of worship, our secretary, Pastor Douglas McCormack, always has a little point right at the end, before he says, have, have a happy Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. He says, this day in history... They launched the Titanic or, or whatever else. I'm sure he has one of the T-shirts that says on the back, it was okay when it left here, which they sell in Belfast, apparently. Do you know what happened 20 years ago? I'm, I'll excuse those who are only having their 19th birthday today. Those who are a little older. Do you remember 20 years ago? I didn't remember until I looked up on it, and I was intrigued. What happened the week before last, then? Did you have any local elections here? Did you vote? Shame on those that didn't. If we render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, we also should require an answer from them. That includes voting to enfranchise yourself. I couldn't vote on May the 4th because in England only a third of the councils were up for election. That did not include Milton Keynes. So it was no slackness on my part. On June the 8th, I am going to vote, God willing. I want to renew my mandate to criticise the politicians. And to do that, I have to vote. I'll not be voting for the ones I criticise, mind. 20 years ago, on May the 1st, we voted in a general election. And in our house 20 years ago, there was great rejoicing because we had two young people who were both over the age of 18 the first time at a general election. And they went and voted in a general election for the first time. I was rejoicing then. What about now? 
I'm not going to use the B word. But do we care about other people anymore? Do we only care for ourselves? What about America first? You know it was spelt with a K originally. The National Socialists, as they were called in the 1930s in America, had a slogan called America first. What is it? Is the devil take the hindermost? Do we not care for society? It was very different 20 years ago. I look back at the notes I took. The Tories were having a renewal. They weren't in office, though. Not anymore. But they had a new leader in a new direction at that time. Labour Party had a renewal after 18 years in opposition. New Prime Minister, new government, they were rejoicing. Lib Dems, first time since 1929 they had more than 30 MPs. The SNP, not sure what their renewal was because it was 394 years since James I of came in in 1603, or it was 430 years since James VI of Scotland. Well, of course, it was the same person, wasn't it? But they reckoned they had a new mandate. I'm not sure what they've done with it so far. See, in a way like the church, the government also has to have strong checks and balances. It has been said it's more important to have a strong opposition than it is to have a strong government. And if I look back in my lifetime... Some of the best government decisions that were taken is when the government didn't have a stonking big majority, when they had to take account of what other people thought, when they had to reach a consensus, when they had to do things for the majority of people in the country. Twenty years ago, Christians were saying, we've got a fresh start. After, did you remember the greed is good of the 1980s? fresh start after the shame of the way asylum seekers were being refused entry to this country. A fresh start from pictures of women prisoners in hospitals shackled to the beds and the practice being defended by the minister at the time. I don't care if she's managed to reinvent herself and join the Catholic Church. It was a shameful thing. There were young people being denied decent education and benefits and we thought we had an a fresh start, and things did get better. So what about Christian renewal at that time? How often do we need a Christian renewal? There was a big fuss, wasn't there, at the year 2000. They tried to tell us it was the start of the second millennium. Well, it wasn't. First of all, that would have to be 2001. And secondly, of course, if they were doing it anno domini, the year of our Lord, he wasn't born in 1 BC or 1 AD either. So they got it wrong on all counts. But 430 years in Scotland, is that enough to renew Christianity? 100 years, new century, is that enough? 68 years, Liberal Democrats were celebrating at that time. Is that enough? 18 years, that was how long Labour had been in opposition. Dread to think how long they're going to be in opposition now. Five years? They change a government every five years, supposedly? Every year. Should Christians be renewing every New Year's Day? Good idea. What about every Sabbath day? Should we be renewing every Sabbath day? It seems to get very difficult now, post-Trump and post that B word again. It was said that you can't fool all of the people all of the time. Cynics say perhaps you can. But what about renewal for us? We need to keep a perspective. In that scripture we read from Isaiah 40 this morning, you remember it said, a voice cries out and I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flower fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. 
if the flowers and the grass last such a little time and the people are like that, then we need to have a lot more renewal, don't we? This really is back to basics. The frustration, nothing happening. Some people even write to the messenger, don't they? They're asking, what's the point of the conference? Everybody knows they're doing nothing. I wish. Friday morning's the worst. My phone rings off the hook on a Friday morning. Can't believe the number of people that have left things to the last minute in the week. Oh dear, I need this doing before the Sabbath. I think I'll have to go elsewhere on a Friday morning. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, what has happened will happen again, and what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. And when did you write that? 940 BC, possibly? It's a long time ago, 3,000 years ago. Nothing really has changed, has it? About the reason for all this concern. On Isaiah again, chapter 58 this time. And it's such a marvellous passage. I hope you'll bear with me when I read a few extra verses for context. What is it Dr. Daniel Duda says? A text without a context is a pretext. We'll try a bit of context here. So I'm going to start in verse 3. Why have we fasted, they say, and you haven't seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you haven't even noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please. You exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends with quarrelling and strife and in striking one another with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I've chosen, the Lord says? Only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed, for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, he says, to loose the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke? to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry, to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe him, not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, Here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing figure, finger and the malicious talk, if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in an unscorched land and will strengthen your frame. You'll be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. The refrain in Psalm 70 says, Restore us, O God. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. I like the bits about being restored. I, as you know, there is now no statutory date of retirement anymore. I'm very pleased to. So all the ministers, as they approach what would have been retirement date, just send a little note in and say, I would like to continue working. And that's fine. It's an excellent idea. I'm not sure what I would do usefully with my time if I was put out to grass at the moment. That's certainly not the case. The problem I have is that I can't do seven days a week. I'm told it's not a problem. When you go somewhere on the Sabbath day, you have a day off in loo during the week. Oh, yes, and which day is this going to be in Treasury? Which day are we not going to pay people's bills? 
There are two themes, though, that recur in Scripture. They are inextricably linked. And the first one is about the renewal of the covenant relationship. Deuteronomy 5, I'm sure you know. I will be their God, he said. They shall be my people. And then the resultant behavior from that is what is important. Do you ever feel weak and feeble? I do. Goodness knows. In Desire of Ages, Ellen White wrote, All who consecrate soul, body, and spirit to God will be constantly receiving a new endowment of physical and mental power. The inexhaustible supplies of heaven are at their command. Christ gives them the breath of his own spirit, the life of his own life. The Holy Spirit puts forth its highest energies to work in heart and mind. The grace of God enlarges and multiplies their faculties and every perfection of the divine nature comes to their assistance in the work of saving souls. Through cooperation with Christ, they are complete in him and in their human weakness they are enabled to do deeds of omnipotence. <coughs> That's terrific. I find that restoring, refreshing. And I look back and I, I copied that in there 20 years ago. Didn't know I'd need to be reading it now. The second thing that is linked to the renewal of the covenant relationship, according to the scripture, is the restoration of the two, true Sabbath worship. Now, you know in Exodus 20, and I'm sure even the children learn, I can remember learning the Ten Commandments from Exodus 20. And in verses 8 to 12, in the fourth commandment, it talks about the Sabbath day. <coughs> it had been originally designed as a memorial to creation <coughs> and as a token of Israel's covenant with their God. Back to the first part again. In chapter 31, it says the Israelites must keep the Sabbath, observing it in every generation. How long? As a covenant forever. It's a sign forever between me and the Israelites, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth on the seventh day, he ceased work and refreshed himself. I like that translation. It's not a case of resting so much as refreshing himself. Desire of ages again. To all who receive the Sabbath as a sign of Christ's creative and redeeming power, it will be a delight. Seeing Christ in it, they delight themselves in him. Sabbath points them to the works of creation as evidence of his mighty power and redemption. So it's not a case that, oh dear, it's Sabbath, I can't go shopping. Maybe it's easy for the brethren than the sisters. It's more of a case, it's Sabbath, oh good, I can't go shopping. It is a day of rest. I must confess that I'm working more hours than I did in commerce for all those years. I've yet to feel more stressed. Yes, there are stressful days. Dealing with people is always stressful. But it's not as bad as I thought it would be in that respect. Um, if I'm confessing, I've taken the opportunity. I don't know whether you know what one of the, the main uh, problems with accountants is when they work. Um, the stress we work under, we solve it by, by coffee. I was up to 10 or 12 cups a day when I was working up in London. I thought, oh good, this is a chance for me to go cold turkey. So I stopped. And my secretary brings me cups of Broibosch tea now, which I'm very pleased to have. And I managed to quit completely. I'm not saying I wouldn't have a cup occasionally somewhere else, but that's certainly not on church business. And I felt very pleased about that, and I'm sure that's helped to, to revive me physically. But this restoration has a purpose there. It's not just a restoration, it's a restoration to serve. Jeremiah wrote in chapter 15, Why is my pain unending, and my wound grievous and incurable? Will you be to me like a deceptive brook, like a spring that fails? Therefore, this is what the Lord says. If you repent, I will restore you that you may serve me. 
So, back to the original question. If all those political parties and groups had their restoration, as it were, how long do we need, how often do we need renewal? Desire of ages again. Day by day, God instructs his children. By the circumstances of the daily life, he's preparing them to act their part upon the wider stage to which his providence has appointed them. It's the issue of the daily test that determines their victory or defeat in life's great crises. Those who fail to recognise their constant dependence upon God will be overcome by temptation. We may now suppose that our feet stand secure and we will never be moved. We may say with confidence, I know in whom I have believed. Nothing can shake my faith in God and in his word, but Satan is planning to take advantage of our hereditary and cultivate, cultivated traits of character and to blind our eyes to our own necessities and defects, only through really realising our own weakness and looking steadfastly unto Jesus can we walk securely. I didn't mention camp meeting this morning, did I? I'm going to be in trouble when I get back to the office. As well as bringing greetings, I had to mention <laughs> camp meeting to you. Now, I don't know how I do this because I've never been to camp meeting myself. My staff keep smirking at me. They say, oh yes, this, you're going to have some experience this year. I'm sure I will. I don't know what it's going to be like entirely, but I've been looking at the program there and there are certain things. Pastor Juan Carlos, who's the new teen director, is taking the early morning prayer and praise at six o'clock. I've got to be there for that. Dr. Daniel Duda is doing the Bible study every day at midday. Can't miss that. Not sure about the rest of it yet. We'll have to see what happens. My staff tell me, no, no, don't worry yourself. Just wander around in your shorts and we'll do all the work. Well, there's going to be no wandering around in shorts, believe me. But I hope to see some of you, apart from the workers, yes, at camp meetings certainly. I know with some of the London churches when I went there, and they said, what do you mean concerned that we'd be at camp meeting? They said, we've already booked the coach. I think it will be a time of revival and renewal for many. And I was concerned. Do you remember, was it last quarter where we studied on, about Job in our lessons, in the Sabbath school lesson, or the one before? The one before, dear me. Yes, old age does do something to the time. We studied about Job, and I wondered, in the light of the book of Job, particularly the beginning part, do you remember his children were all gathered together in the house in one place? So what happens if we have virtually all the executive all of the ministers and several thousand of the members of SEC all gathered in one place in Prostatin on the Sabbath day. We had the rest of the book of Job, of course, as well, so we know there's going to be protection there. Can you imagine Satan looking down there and thinking, if only I could get to that lot, I'd wipe them all out. As I said, we did all of the book of Job. If you just had the first few weeks, you might get a wrong feeling. But I'm sure the Lord will protect us. But it is, it is a thought that so many of the saints gathered in one place at one time. But it will be a time of renewal for the children, for the teens, for the youth, for the adults, for everyone. But the ultimate part of the threefold fulfillment of the government is yet to come. I mean, the first part was easy. That took place at the crucifixion, easy for us, I mean. When Jesus cried, it is finished on the cross, it was a triumphant statement to the Father, what? About the success of his mission. It wasn't a failure, it was success. That was the plan. And the second part took place after the resurrection. Desire of Ages again says, before the foundations of the earth were laid, the Father and the Son had united in a covenant to redeem man if he should be overcome by Satan. The plan was already there. They had clasped their hands in a solemn pledge that Christ should become the surety for the human race. This pledge he fulfilled. 
The compact has been fully carried out. Now he can declare, Father, it is finished. I've done my will, O oh my God. I've completed the work of redemption. If thy justice is satisfied, quote, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. John 19, 17. So after the resurrection, when he returned to the Father, the second part was fulfilled. Now the third part, what about that? That's yet to come. But the third part, we, may, we have the promise of being able to see with our own eyes the final completion of the covenant of salvation. The final renewal of the right relationship with our God on that day. As we discussed in Sabbath school, when it comes to the judgment day, it's not what you've done, it's who you know. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, he will say, depart from me. If you do, he will say, doesn't matter what they've done. There will be a reality of our hope on that day. Until then, when life can seem to be too much, when all around us all we see is sin and justice, we can claim the promise we find in Isaiah. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Amen. Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and may all your plans succeed. Amen. <laughs>